What is up guys? I now have my electronics lab sort of set up in my man cave. This stuff's been pushed into the corner, been on the back burner for almost two years now. Finally getting this stuff out to mess around with again. I have my desk and my comfy chair and a cheap smart TV to watch YouTube. And as what will happen when you mess with this kind of stuff is you will spend like four hours on it one afternoon without even realizing it. Especially when you're dinking with this kind of stuff right here and pull your hair out for hours to have something just not work. <laughs> Eventually got it to work. So basically I have um, some stepper motors that I want to start using for some projects. One such project is I want to make a base that I can adjust the uh, azimuth and the altitude of a telescope to basically use a joystick to aim it at the moon, the stars, or whatever. Because when you move a telescope by hand, it really sucks and you overshoot. It's really hard and difficult to aim at objects um, that far away with that kind of optical zoom. So I'd like to be able to mount my camera on it and maybe um, just use some kind of remote means to adjust it with real fine increments, which you can do with stepper motors. I bought a couple of those stepper motors, plus I have a bunch of used ones out of printers and stuff. This one has gear reduction, which will give it a lot of torque uh, and a lot of precision. So um, those not familiar with such a thing, it's not like a regular motor where you just put power and it just spins. It's actually a two poles, and uh, the two po each pole is like 1.8 degrees apart, I think, on um, this one. I think this one's the same. Let's go back to the schematics for it. And it says step angle 1.8 degrees. So every time you basically uh, put DC current to one of the poles, and it aligns, and then if you uh, basically put power to the next pole to make it move a notch. It's only going to move 1.8 degrees of shaft rotation. That's just like one little click. Um, less than that actually because you're using um, quarter step or eighth step or whatever. So, But if you take like the calculator, let's try to explain this to one of our friends. You need 360 degrees to do one revolution. So you divide that by 1.8 degrees per step, that's gonna take 200 steps. That's 200 actual separate commands to get that motor to move one full revolution. And that is applying current to one field, and then you can apply current to the next field, and if the rotor you know, will go in between the two, then you release the current on this one, and it'll line up to this one, and so on. And these, just for representation, they're like actually repeated all the way around. It only turns 1.8 degrees um, between one phase to the other. So 200 steps. So <laughs> and you, that's 200 steps of putting current, then putting current to the next winding, releasing the current from the first winding, then starting over at the first winding, but reversing the polarity of the battery voltage, basically, and repeating that. That's That would take a lot, especially to do it 200 times <laughs> to get it to spin once. So you have to have electronics to drive that. So this is a board that drives the uh, stepper motors and makes it pretty simple. It has the, the two phases are hooked up here to the outputs and basically you just give it a pulse for every, uh, and it'll, it'll increment the steps doing the phasing automatically and then you can reverse direction. You can also put some jumpers to do a quarter step or eighth step or half step or whatever. I think I've been just on full step right now, which makes it spin faster, but you lose a little bit of precision. But that sure beats uh, doing it this way. I've made a homemade um, stepper motor controllers. Here's where the microprocessor goes by. I use just independent MOSFETs. Yep, and then another one to uh, use pulse width modulation for the power to it. Because you go up to full power when you need to drive it, but then you got to drop the power down, the current down, to, just to hold it in where it's at. If you leave it at full power all the time, those motors will get really hot. But you want to use full uh, spikes of current to get it to move when it's under load because you need that torque. But once it's moved, then you need less current to hold it in position. So th this, I believe, does it automatically. So I don't have to do it in software. All I have to do it now with my microprocessor is just say, give it a pulse each time I want it to move. 
And then if I needed reverse direction, just um, basically make that output go high to the board and it'll go the other direction. So, so for first testing, I have an oscilloscope that also has a frequency generator built into it so I can set out, you know, a frequency pulse. So this one here is hooked up to this board here, which has, um, let's put this jumper down here so I can look at the frequency. This is the frequency generator coming out of here. And it makes it move. And it's just one pulse, you know, I could speed it up. Change this so you can see it. There's the speed of it. Go a little faster there. This motor, these can only go so fast. As they start messing up, you gotta turn the current up, but you wanna kinda keep the current as low as possible so this sucker won't need a heat sink or anything if you put it in a project box. So of course I just crank it up as it's gonna freak out. It can't it cannot phase the poles that fast, so. But you can get it moving pretty fast. And then with that, through some gear reduction, you have accuracy. Because basically, in a microprocessor, if you give it one pulse or one step, especially if you like turn this to like eight step, I mean, it's only going to move like a, not even 1.8 degrees. I think it's even less than that. And um, then you go through a gear reduction. I mean, when you make one pulse, you can't even see the movement on your, uh, on that, the, uh, my telescope thing. So it'll take like probably hundreds of pulses to get that to turn just to even see a movement in it. So that's where you're going to get your accuracy and precision. So, but I just wanted to make a pulse generator out of that thing. It was a lot of work. Get that stupid assembly language going. Which is this stuff, which is crazy. This is the most rudimentary like computer language there is. But you have to use it sometimes when you need to have absolute control of a little microprocessor. So, and I mean, this is like one little thing at a time. You know, bit clear file. The, and this is my timer um, interrupt flag uh, peripheral interface, you know, that's in, built into these little chips. They have a lot of little timers and... Uh, all sorts of different stuff in there, hardware that's in, built into the chip, and you can just activate different parts of it, pulse width modulators, uh, analog to digital converters, whatever. So in this case, it's using timers, and you basically get a load of value into it by moving the, you know, the uh, value into that register and copying it into the timer one high bank, basically, and then the timer low. You load it into, the, into there, and then you're going to turn it on. I mean, this is... <laughs> rudimentary one step at a time and basically turn it on and leave the interrupt subroutine and basically whenever uh, the timer rolls over it causes an interrupt condition and then this goes the interrupt handler is what this is and uh, for the timer it's going to be you know bit test file skip if clear the timer one interrupt flag so but if it isn't clear if it's set because it rolled over then it's not going to skip the next command it's going to go to it which is down here which is going to clear it the flag clear the interrupt flag too for another interrupt basic turn off the timer load the new variables which is what i'm programming into it and then turning the timer back on and then it leaves the subroutine or the interrupt subroutine basically and then this is the regular subroutine which is just real simple here and it's just in basic pick basic this is where you get all the normal if, thens, else's, and all that kind of logic statements. So, this is just printing out basically stuff on the screen. Right there. And then button interfaces and stuff like that so I can push buttons and it speeds it up and slows it down or switches directions. It's not much to it. I have programs that you like just gotta scroll like a mile down to get through it. This one's like really simple because it's just doing one thing basically. So I just made a change to it. So I need to load that. Actually, did I compile it first? Gotta make sure I compiled it. Load it. Set that there. Oops. It was pissed because it didn't see the chip. Duh. So I gotta. Put my programming connector on the chip here. 
something I made so I didn't have to pull chips out or whatever. It's a real easy way to program it. So it should see it this time. Yes, it did because it says the chip is not erased. It's got something in there. I'm going to say yes right over that stuff. Boom. So, and I can leave that on there usually, but get it started. So, so this motor here, which is like some used one to took out of a printer or something, I got a pulse going. I think I kind of made it to where I could hit both buttons and skip fast. Yep. Just keep speeding it up. Get up there. I think that can max it out. My, this is fast as the timer's going. And then I can push my other button to basically change clockwise and counterclockwise. So if you look at the motor when I do that. <laughs> That's just for testing motors. That's all that um, program chip's going to be used for is just to send out signals to this board to driver board just to test these things hook it up and manually go once you actually build something you got to have you know then you're going to be programming it to set pulses you know uh, probably like if i use a joystick kind of control it'll be you know start out real slow and the more i move the joystick the faster it's going to spin one way or faster the other way you might put some feedback or whatever like in switches that way you the device won't try to move too far or so it can home or whatever and if you get really crafty you can like remember how many pulses something was at and probably have it um, go there from memory so that thing is moving pretty fast it's moving about three or four um revolutions per second Remember, it takes 200 pulses right now to make it go once, so it's doing about over 600 pulses a second, probably. Just slow it down, it slows that down. Frequency. So basically, you go zero. 200. 200 of those pulses at that slow speed. <laughs> so that's a lot faster. So basically you need something like that to test stepper motors because there's just no way to like <laughs> sequence them by hand with batteries or whatever and get them to spin <laughs> by any means. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be connecting batteries one step at a time, reverse and polarity and everything, just to do 200 sequences to get it to turn the shaft one revolution. Pretty cool. So, it's a data sheet. I let the pin lay out. What's all on each pin? Interrupts, analog inputs, whatever. Not bad for like a two dollar chip. A lot of people use use parallax. And now they're using uh, Adrenos or whatever. Um, they cost a lot more, and they're pretty much you're kind of stuck with whatever the boards are set up for. But they're real easy, and they make all a bunch of parts for it. In fact, um, people might be buying these and sticking these on the Adrenos. I'm using uh, microchip, which is a real basic microprocessor. In fact, uh, a lot of the other microprocessors like Parallax and stuff just use small microchips embedded on their board that interprets it and then you use it with their um, hardware and software but you're kind of limited to what you can do.